Um, I'd like to talk about my philosophy on acoustic neuromas, and as you know, they come in different sizes, and they can be called the good, the bad, and also the ugly. And uh, we all are familiar with the acoustic grading scales, and obviously the three and four ones are the ones that start to compress the brainstem and can cause some problems. Uh, one of the major treatment objectives in acoustic neuroma surgery is we have to preserve the facial nerve, and this is very important from the patient's perspective, and we have to try to remove as much tumor as possible if it's safe to, to, to resect. Uh, one of the things that you may be hearing uh, in the literature and also at national meetings is this concept of adaptive hybrid surgery. This is a concept where the surgeon does a planned subtotal resection followed by gamma knife. And this is a paper from the UK showing what the post-op MRI looks like. And this is concerning because um, what this is resulting, at least in the United States, is there are now more, special, uh, more surgeons who are not skull-based surgeons treating these tumors, thinking that this can be an acceptable treatment. So um, this is an example of a patient with this large acoustic neuroma. Uh, underwent resection by another surgeon in the community, uh, barely removed anything, and he told the patient's family, we got most of it and the rest is inoperable, we can shrink it with radiation. And after radiation, this patient was quadriparesis, nonverbal and nonambulatory, and uh, the medical team was considering to put this patient in hospice, which is end-of-life care. So luckily, this patient was uh, seen by one of my colleagues who transferred it to my center, and uh, we came in trans lab, and uh, I was able to remove a uh, majority of it. I had to leave a thin rim because it was stuck to the facial nerve because of previous radiation. And this is nine years post-op, stable, stable, minimal residual, and now she's able to walk and she's able to lead a normal life. And this is nine years post-op. So this is what's happening in our community. If we look at this uh, uh, meta-analysis of this hybrid approach, all the studies show that the, the debulking is only intracapsular. So none of these surgeons are attempting to come outside of the tumor to try to attempt dissection of the facial nerve. The follow-up was relatively short. The tumor control weight was 94%. And if you look at their results, the facial nerve result's not bad. It's 96%. And they say the hearing is 60%, although the, the follow-up is still short. So these preliminary results, I think, to the general public, look very favorable. But this is what happens. They result in these Apple Core Macintosh-like resections. And we have to ask ourselves, are we doing the best thing for our patient? So the criticisms of this type of approach is that the subtotal resection is already planned. It's already set in the mind that I'm not even going to try to remove the tumor. And the debulking is primarily intracapsular, which makes the surgeon have a difficult time to assess how much you really remove. Because unless you come around the tumor, oftentimes you end up leaving more than you really think. So there's a huge spectrum of subtotal resections. Not all subtotals are created equal. And this type of data is lacking long-term follow-up. And we don't know what's gonna happen in 10 to 20 years and perhaps we're creating a new emerging disease. And if we're forgetting how to teach our young generation, the next generation, how to do safe and proper facial nerve dissection. So uh, in a sense, this is becoming a lost art. So does it matter how much you leave behind? If you look at the literature, the rate of recurrence is directly proportional to the volume of tumor that is left. And these are all studies that support that. If you look at this analysis from the Mayo Clinic, uh, those that uh, were larger than a particular subtotal of more than five to five by five millimeters, uh, this tended to have higher rate of re recurrence. So in a sense, the extent of resection does matter. So these are three examples of certain tumors that uh, I had previously treated. Uh, this, this is, um, a near complete, so you barely see any radiographic, but me as the surgeon, I know I left something little on the nerve, and so I call that a near total. And anything between 95 to 99, I define as subtotal, and anything less than 95 uh, is, a, is, a, is another type of subtotal. So you can see this as a spectrum of subtotal, 
and not all subtotals are created equal. So how can we achieve maximal tumor resection with the least amount residual and still achieve the best facial nerve outcome? Um, if we look at uh, this uh, commentary by uh, Michael Link, he says that uh, if, you need, if you want to really achieve a meaningful debulking, you really have to come extracapsular because if you just stay intracapsular, you're just making a large volume tumor with just a hole in the middle and it doesn't really reduce the uh, radiosurgical uh, advantage. So um, the rationale for people who do these types of hybrid is that in this paper you, you can see that uh, there's a significant rate of facial nerve and cochlear nerve deficits. So they're automatically making the assumption that if you try to do a gross total, you're going to get a facial nerve palsy. So let's, let's look back to uh, uh, the good Professor Yasergil, and he said this in a recent meeting in Istanbul. I heard him say this in a lecture. He said, the assertion that complete elimination of a CNS lesion will carry the risk of significant morbidity neglects to consider the fact of the surgeon's competency. So we can't attribute any, everything to a technique. We, we, we as surgeons have to be held accountable, and uh, uh, our ability to do these things has to factor in to the morbidity and mortality. So with the increasing popularity of this hybrid approach, uh, what's going to happen to the future of our trainees? And who is going to perform difficult, challenging microsurgeries of acoustic neuromas, but also other complex CP angle tumors? So in a sense, these acoustic tumors, just like complex aneurysms, is becoming a lost art, the lost art of microsurgery. So, these people who do this hybrid approach, they call it a nerve-centered approach because they're focused on preserving the nerve, but they're not focused on maximal tumor removal. So I propose that if we can do uh, an intended gross total, and this can still be a nerve-centered approach. So my typical philosophy is we have to try to attempt a gross total in all cases, if safely possible, and if you have to leave something behind to preserve the nerve, it's an intraoperative decision, not a preoperative decision. And we have to maximize the extent of resection. So if we're going to leave some tumor, let's try to leave the least amount physically possible so that in an effect, it's a radical subtotal, radical near total. The technique that, that has been helpful for me that I started using uh, is this technique that was described by Sasaki. It's called the subperineural subcapsular plane of dissection. And if you look at this cartoon, notice that the vestibular nerves is stretched around the tumor, and this thin membrane is the perineurium. So there's a thin perineurium around the tumor, and this perineurium acts as a buffer uh, between the tumor and the cochlear and facial nerve. So if you pick up the plane of dissection along the vestibular nerve, and you peel the tumor capsule away from this perineurium, you have an extra layer of tissue that will protect you from the facial nerve. And I believe that this will help uh, prevent any injury or devascularization to the facial nerve. If we look at peripheral nerve tumors, let's say a, a tumor in the arm or leg, the, the concept is to peel the perineurium off the tumor capsule and then divide it at its smallest fascicle. So it's like peeling an onion. And you can do this same type of principle uh, in acoustic neuroma. This thin layer of perineurium is often clear, and it looks transparent like uh, arachnoid. But it's not arachnoid. So it's, it's actually stretched perineurium. And I call this the holy veil. So we, we have to pr preserve this holy veil. And at the end of surgery, oftentimes you don't see the nerve. You may see it transparent behind this curtain. But trust that the nerve is there. And you could do this with small tumors such as this. This is a smaller tumor. And you can also do it with these larger tumors uh, such as this Coos grade three vestibular schwannoma. So this is a, a retrosigmoid approach. We've already opened up the IAC. And, and what we'll do here is we'll start dissecting distally. And after dissecting distally, we'll come uh, medially and then we'll peel the arachnoid off the tumor capsule and then we'll go ahead and debulk the tumor with an ultrasonic aspirator. Now, after debulking, I'm starting to pick up the perineurium here. You see how this is a clear membrane? 
This is not arachnoid, this is perineurium, and it's like a glove. It's like a glove that fits around the tumor capsule, and we'll try to preserve this all around the tumor and continue to follow this plane. And this plane will eventually take us uh, over the facial nerve, and the facial nerve will be uh, behind this transparent curtain. And so if we stay in this plane, we will have an extra layer of protection to the facial nerve. So we're peeling the tumor away from the IAC here. This is where it's most adherent, and I use a McElveen knife to divide these areas of adhesions. It's a very useful tool. And I, I, I usually like the Roten 3. It's one of my favorite instruments for this, and a good pair of scissors with this McElveen knife. And we'll go ahead and remove the tumor. This is uh, probably a branch of vestibular or maybe tiny, tiny adherence, but uh, overall uh, a, a good removal. And we'll use an endoscope to make sure we wax off all the air cells and to control the tumor in the IAC. And here, here he is post-op. He had an immediate post-op gr Brackman grade two. I saw him recently now. It's improved to a grade one. And the way we repair the IAC is I put a fat graft in the, uh, after waxing the IAC, I put a small fat graft here with a little fiber and glue. And this was described in one of Roten's atlases some years ago. But this is very effective. And to cover the, the dural defect on the outside, we put a little fat graft here and bolster it with a, a Medpor Titan. And this has been very effective, uh, and I've had 0% CSF leak for retrosigmoid using this approach. And you can see this is uh, what it looks like. There's a fat graft here in the IEC, and uh, with fat suppression, you don't see it uh, anymore. And we published this technique in ACTA some years ago, and this is uh, very effective, in my opinion, when resulted in 0% CSF leaks for retrosigmoid. So here's another example of a translab approach. This is a, a larger tumor. Um, hearing is completely gone. I decided to go translab, but we're going to use the subperineural technique that I had uh, j just described. So we'll go ahead and peel the arachnoid off the tumor capsule. The translab is very nice and favorable because there's no brain retraction. The, the exposure takes you right down on the tumor. And so we'll go ahead and, and peel uh, the tumor away from the brain stem, trying to preserve the subperineural plane using sharp dissection. And then we'll go ahead and try to find that uh, perineural layer so we can work around the tumor. So we're working towards the, uh, the this is the inferior aspect of the tumor. This is the superior aspect. This is the IAC. And the facial nerve is here. So we'll carefully peel the tumor away from the IAC. And then this is the sub the subperineural layer here. You see how it's a, a clear membrane? And then once we find the layer, we'll come around the top and carefully uh, dissect and carefully peel the tumor away using sharp dissection. And then uh, using a, a disc dissector, we'll carefully, again, preserve that perineural layer. Now this tumor had a, 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 a very strong adhesion to the facial nerve, and you'll see in a moment that uh, I use a McElveen knife to, to divide it and use sharp dissection, and I had to leave a very thin, thin remnant that's not even radiographically visible on the MRI. But uh, again, preserving that perineural layer, you have that buffer that's going to protect the facial nerve. We use uh, facial nerve monitoring as well as uh, motor evoked uh, facial nerve, motor evoked potentials. And so this gives me an extra uh, uh, confidence that the nerve is anatomically intact. So this is the part that was very adherent. You can see there's some adhesions here, and I had to use a scissors to eventually dissect and transect the adhesions so that I could preserve the facial nerve. But overall, it was a 99% removal. Here's the facial nerve being stimulated. It's stimulated at 0 0.05 milliamps. And then uh, once we get the last piece of tumor here, this is the last uh, adhesion. We'll divide it sharply and then remove the tumor. Now, there's a little bit of oozing because sometimes there's some bleeding from uh, some of this perineurium, but don't coagulate. If you coagulate this, you're going to damage the facial nerve. Just use a little Surgicel and some gentle pressure and the bleeding will stop. And so the way I repair uh, TransLab is I use this fascia lata and I suture it to uh, the edges 
Obviously, this edge you can't suture, so you lay it down. But this acts like a sling, like a hammock. And so this hammock will hold the fat graft. You put the fat graft there and then put the uh, med pour plate over it to push the fat and uh, bolster it. And with this technique, I, I've had 0% uh, CSF leak. Uh, in the initial paper, it was eight patients, but I, I've done close to 50 now of translab. And this patient had immediate uh, normal facial nerve, radical near total, uh, a good resection. So here are some examples of near total versus gross total. You could see that uh, in, in some of these, there's no radiographic uh, visible tumor. Here's another set of examples of large Coos grade four tumors that were gross to near total and good facial nerve outcomes. This is an example where I, I had a, a Brackman grade three. This was a large cystic tumor, trans lab. You can see uh, this is a, a, a grade three uh, facial palsy. So um, we, we like to avoid as many grade threes as possible. So, We've done this technique in 74 consecutive patients now, 80% retrosig, 20% translab. You can see the majority of these tumors are Coos grade three and four, the large tumors. And the overall facial nerve outcome, uh, House Brackman grade one and two is 95%. And uh, you could see that with the increasing tumor grade, uh, there is a slight decrease in Brackman one and two, but not by much. But what you do see is that with the bigger tumors, as the tumor grade gets higher, there was an increased rate of near total resection. And I think that's based on my, my judgment. Uh, with larger tumors, there tends to be more adherence and adhesions. But overall, there was no significant impact on the, on the overall facial nerve outcome. We did have one recurrence, which is 1.4%, and it was treated with radiotherapy. But the remainder of the patients did not get any radiation. So um, if you look at the series that I just presented versus the meta-analysis that was published, the facial nerve outcome is very comparable. My recurrence rate was much lower than the hybrid approach, and only one patient got radiation, whereas 100% of hybrid patients get radiation. And the follow-up is still short on both sides, but I think we can still achieve excellent facial nerve outcomes while achieving maximal resection of these tumors. The subperineural plane offers a, a nice technique to preserve the facial nerve. And I think the decision to leave a, a residual should be based on intraoperative judgment. And we need to continue to raise the bar of microsurgical techniques and results. And we need to be guardians that preserve the skull base. Thank you for your attention.